Hello, flight instructors and NAFI members. John Niehaus, Director of Program Development for the National Association of Flight Instructors, and I am pleased, as always, to welcome you to another episode of the NAFI More Right Rider Podcast, the podcast for flight instructors on the go. Now, today's podcast sponsor is uh, three groups from the same organization, but uh, Four Flight, Jepson, and Boeing. And uh, they are a great supporter of ours, and uh, they support us in a multitude of ways. Four Flight, if you don't know, gives NAFI members a 33% discount. And so if you aren't a member but use Four Flight, you darn near pay for your NAFI membership off of that discount alone. If you are a member and aren't using the discount, why aren't you using the discount? Um, I'd also like to say that Jepson Boeing has uh, become the key sponsor for the NAFI Professional Development Program. And if you're not familiar with that, what that is, is it is a uh, comprehensive curriculum of all of the important things that uh, instructors need to know that, frankly, a lot of don't know that they need to know. I didn't. Um, but it's, uh, it's key things like business skills, communication skills, risk management skills. And uh, in talks with uh, Jeps and Boeing, they uh, really, really loved the program, and uh, they've been great supporters of it. So without them, the PDP would not be what it is. So if you use the program and you like it, please thank them. If you don't use the program, how could it be bad? Boeing, Jepson enjoy it. So it's got to be good, right? Um, so anyways, we thank Jepson, Boeing, and ForeFlight for uh, all of the, the help that they have provided to NAFI and its members. Um, but without further ado, so last podcast, we did part one of Telling is Not Teaching by Mike Thompson. Um, it's uh, a chapter out of his book, and uh, it's something that uh, we as flight instructors don't always uh, grasp. We understand that um, just by telling somebody it doesn't mean they learn, but sometimes in practice it's hard to remember that that's the case. And uh, so you watch the fir- or listen to the first half. I have the second half ready to go for you. And um, this was originally, both of these were originally Mentor Live programs. And in the show notes, if you go to the links, one link will be to actually watch the presentation should you want to. And the other one is to get Wings credit. So you can get Wings credit from listening or watching or both, whatever you want to do. But uh, if you participate in the Wings program, and I highly, highly encourage that you do, um, you can get Wings credit. So why not? Anyways. Uh, Telling is Not Teaching, Part 2, Mike Thompson. Here we go. Let's take a look at Session 2. Um, the the learning process. What is learning? Learning is natural. Learning comes to us naturally. Um, so starting with the next slide, the learning process needs to focus on the learner. More right rudder. How many of us have heard that? How many of us have joked about that? How many of us as flight instructors have actually said that? Uh, we need more right rudder on this takeoff kind of the old flight instructor joke. But the reason I put that out there, it leads to a very common misconception. The misconception leads to a major disconnect. That uh, is that because I told you something, then now now you know. Uh, That's not necessarily true. Um, You might know of it, uh, but you probably haven't learned it. And why do we do that? Um, we're all guilty of it at some point or other. Well, because it's efficient. Telling is about increasing efficiency. Shifting to the perspective of a teacher is really all about helping the learner. So let's take a look uh, on the next slide. We find out that the teacher, in fact, is a learner. And the more you start to teach and the more you work in this profession, the more you discover that. 
a shift in focus from the efficiency of being a teller to this um, learner-centered helping philosophy of being a teacher allows and in fact causes a relationship to blossom between the teacher and the learner. And as we do this, as we make this shift, as we change our thinking from efficiency to service, um, we become a learner again. We become a learner ourselves. Part of the reason for this is because in order to really be of service to a learner and really help them learn, it requires us as teachers to have a great depth of knowledge. Uh, we need to help learners see whatever they're grappling with from multiple perspectives, multiple depth levels. Well, that imposes upon us as teachers the necessity to really know that material well. That makes us learners. How do we do that? Yeah. Well, I would encourage us all to stay tuned in, stay tuned into the profession. There's a lot of things that can help us there. Professional development, professional development programs through, for example, NAFI. Um, the WINGS program is another way. Uh, other CFIs are a great resource. One of the nice things that I liked about this passage in your book, Mike, was that we don't look at ourselves as a, we look at ourselves as a teacher or a lecturer sometimes, and it's hard to remember that we are a learner. But you know, there's a great adage that we all use, at least I've heard throughout the instructor community as long as I can remember, and that's a, a great instructor is always learning, right? Right. And until you really grasp it, and really until I read that passage in your book, I didn't fully understand the depth of what that really says. So I, I think definitely that gives a lot more substance to it and um, uh, really helps focus in on, on what we mean by a good instructor is always learning. Yeah, absolutely, Rick. And, and if we look at the next uh, slide, we can see that, you know, in large part, that's attitude. A big piece of that is, is my attitude as a professional and how I approach teaching. Think for a second on a teacher that you've had. Um, maybe it was K through 12, maybe it was college, maybe it was a flight instructor, maybe it was informal learning. Some teacher you've had who was not concerned about themselves and focused entirely on you and what you needed. Or a teacher who showed you that they were always learning something new. Maybe it was a flight instructor who told you when they didn't know something, they were comfortable enough to say, hmm, good question, I don't know. And more importantly, followed up, found out, and then showed you that they went and found out. Uh, that's a role model. Um, when's the last time you talked to a, uh, to a flight instructor who said, I went to a seminar because I wanted to, not because I had to? Uh, right. And when you find yourself start doing that, uh, you say, yeah, yeah, it's an attitude. It's an attitude of teaching. So if we look at the next slide, you know, we sometimes ask ourselves, so, so what is this learner-centered curriculum? How do I make this shift? Well, the simple definition is a learner-centered curriculum are lessons that are tailored to the learner's needs. Um, this is what it means to be learner-centered. <clears throat> when we go through our training, um, one of the things we do as instructors is we learn to, to write lessons and, and, uh, and we build what we call, you know, my lesson plans. This is, you know, the lesson plans that I built for me as a teacher. And, and that's all well and good because uh, in part, one of the things that does is it forces us to, to go deeper into that instructional knowledge level. Um, but now as you hear me talk about becoming a better teacher and focusing on teaching versus telling, and you say, oh my goodness, how do I make sense of this all? There's so many different lesson plan varieties that the FAA offers. And, you know, I went out to Google and I saw what they have and, and uh, my fellow flight instructors did it one way and somebody else did it another. Um, how do I make sense of this? Start with the learner. Start by asking, well, who are they? Who is this learner? Uh, for example, maybe we're teaching steep turns. 
Well, Steve turns to a first time pilot who's, you know, never seen one before is a different student than Steep turns to an experienced pilot. Maybe they're going for a commercial. Maybe they're scraping some rust off. Maybe it's a biennial. So who is this person? Um, now, have no fear. You know, you might be saying, oh, no, you're telling me that all of the work I did for my CFI, what am I supposed to do, toss that out? Uh, if we take a look at the next slide, no, no, I'm not telling you that at all. I'm not telling you to toss that out. We can talk a lot more about that in chapter six when we look at um, building syllabi and building lessons and how to do it. At this point, I just want you to focus on using those lesson plans as a guide to help your learner make connections. Please don't use them as a script to a one person show. The student must be engaged. If they're not, why not? Now, exploring this question, uh, your relationship with that learner is key. Let's take a look at the next slide. And we have to ask ourselves: is what I'm doing one dimensional? Am I not making connections? Am I boring? <laughs> Are they airsick? Uh, do they understand? And what we very frequently do is, in, in the world of flight instruction and in the world of teaching at large, we turn to our student and we say, well, do you understand? So this is a closed-ended question. And if you give this closed-ended question to the average adult, whether they understand or not, what are they going to say? Absolutely, I understand. Yep, I sure do understand. Um, so that's not quite good enough. We have to shift from the lesson, do you understand what I'm telling you, to the student. So let's take a look at the next slide. One of the things that's going to help me make that shift to the student, to being learner-centered, is this four-part cycle. This four-part cycle will help us make sense of all of it. I want you to think for a second about a guided chaos. Imagine, if you will, two different classrooms. One extremely orderly. You open the door, teachers at the front, students are seated, everyone's quiet, everyone's attentive, all the rows are lined up straight. Uh, it's a giant snooze fest, honestly, <laughs> you know? Imagine Sounds another like classroom. Class, uh, Have yeah, you been in some of those classrooms, Rick? <laughs> Yeah, now imagine this one. You open the door and, you know, it's uh, it's active, it's noisy, people are moving around, people are smiling, laughing, engaged, and you think to yourself, well, there's no learning going on in here. This is chaos. Uh, don't be so sure. Think of it as guided chaos. If I've built an effective learner-centered curriculum, that's exactly what I want to see. And the reason is because we all learn differently, as we know. And if I have an overarching guideline to what this process is about and where I'm trying to take this learner, I know they're all going to get there differently. So what may appear to be chaos really is not chaos at all. There are all these learners engaged in different ways, getting to where they, they need to go. So let's look at, let's explore how this cycle helps us focus on the needs of the learner. <clears throat> if we move to the next slide, we see part one, that is motivation. Um, so the principle here is that learning is purposeful. Now we know that from the Aviation Instructor Handbook chapter two, and in fact, that's exactly right. It is purposeful. Um, let's take a look at the next slide and explore a little bit what we mean by that. Part one of the learning cycle is motivation. Without motivation, nothing else happens. 
okay? Think of a, uh, a, a, a tissue paper cup. Imagine that, that you're the cup, you're the tissue paper, and the water is the content. Well, we pour the water into a tissue paper cup, and what happens? We got a big mess on the table. Yep. Now, Come think of a cup made of glass. We pour in the water, and there it is. We're holding the content. When we're engaged in something that we want to do or something that we want to learn, we do better. In other words, when we're motivated, we're the glass and not the tissue paper. When we do better, we feel a sense of accomplishment. We feel a sense of competence. And that's reinforcing. Because when we feel better, then we're more motivated to do it further. We feel better. It reinforces. So looking at the next slide, we see that part one of the learning cycle engages the learners with a sense of purpose. Now, engaging with this purpose can be the attention getter. Sometimes we see uh, lesson plans, FAA lesson plans, uh, and they talk about the quote unquote attention getter. Um, in, in other theories of uh, curriculum development, this is known as the quote unquote, the set. Uh, it can go by other names as well. What we're really talking about in every case is focusing the learner's attention. We're literally engaging the attention centers of the brain. So in the next slide, we see that the motivation portion of the cycle, these activities don't have to be complicated. I don't have to spend hours of work coming up with them or implementing them. They can be short, they can be sweet, they can be very simple. In, in fact, sometimes it is as easy as answering the learner's question, why? Now, we're working with adult learners and we very commonly get this question from adults. Why am I learning this? Hmm, good question. Let's take a look at the next slide. Why am I learning this? Well, an honest answer to this question, first of all, builds trust and confidence. And hearkening back to chapter one of the book in human behavior, and we understand that this is all about human relationships. Remember, the, the new school is the old school. In spite of all of our advancements, the brain still learns much the same way it always has. Uh, so we need this relationship in place. This trust and confidence builds that relationship. So, student says, why S-turns? You know, I'm a busy guy. I'm a busy person. I'm a busy gal. My Cirrus 22 is an expensive machine. I don't plan to do these S-turns across the road in my Cirrus, so I'm, I'm doing these just to get, you know, just for the examiner, just to get past the practical test. Mm. Next slide, please. As the instructor, I may say, uh, if I'm looking at the next slide, I may ask, are you going to fly this airplane in the wind? Are you going to turn it? Student says to me, well, you know, duh, of course, yes, I am. All right. If we were to look in the 8083-3B in Chapter 6 on ground reference maneuvers, if we were to look up the S turns, one of the things we'd see there is this. This maneuver presents a practical application for the correct, correction of wind during a turn. By the way, that's not just for the examiner. In fact, the examiner is a very, very small portion of this whole equation. You're going to turn an airplane and account for the wind the rest of your flying career, whether you're flying a Cub or a 747. Sound of penny dropping, ka-ching, purpose, student gets it. Ah, that's it. That's why I'm doing this, okay? Motivational, next slide. Now, I'm focused, I'm engaged, I see the purpose, I have a clear goal. That's 
quadrant one or, or part one of the learning cycle. Now I'm ready for part two. Part two is comprehension. Now that I'm focused and ready to learn, what is it that I'm going to learn? And the principle here, learning's multifaceted. So let's take a look at that. In this phase, perception, well, of course, in every phase, uh, but in this phase, perception is going to play a key role. Any learning relies upon the ability to perceive. Perception results from making sense of an experience and attaching some meaning to it. To do this, it has to make it to the brain in the first place. And this is via perception. So I sometimes describe the brain, Rick, as, as three pounds of jelly hidden away uh, in darkness, trapped inside my skull. Right. Well, how does that how does this three pound jelly computer, this 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 absolutely fascinating uh, organ called the brain, uh, interact with the world? Of course, through our five senses, that's Absolutely. perception. And when we see the graphs that show um, visual sight way high and um, uh, a taste and smell and touch, you know, much lower. Uh, don't misinterpret that graph as meaning this is how we learn things. Uh, take a look at that graph carefully, what it means for a normal, healthy, average human being. That's unfortunately not all of us, okay, but for your normal, average, healthy person, we perceive the majority um, uh, of our environment through sight. That's what that graph is telling us. Um, those of you who are from Alaska or out in Wyoming like I am, or maybe you're a dog owner, uh, you know bears and dogs perceive their environment much more through their nose, right, for example. So this is what we mean by perception. It doesn't mean how we learn. It means how we give this three-pound jelly computer access to the universe, okay? So everything comes to us via perception. So if we take a look at the next slide, the principle is that um, multifaceted works best. Okay, why? Because it aids perception. How does it aid, per aid, aid perception? Well, association of word patterns such as mnemonics, things like this are helpful even at the rote level. But perception can lead to understanding, thereby to concepts, application, correlation, the proverbial light bulb goes off. Okay, um, in the next slide we see that in the comprehension phase, we're not implying that the learner has comprehension, but rather during this phase we're working toward comprehension. Uh, the focus now is on background knowledge needed, okay? So we've been through motivation. Uh, maybe it was as simple as answering the question, why am I learning this? In any case, uh, we see the purpose, we're focused, we're motivated. Now we're looking at this new material, and this learning is going to be related to prior learning. In the Aviation Instructor Handbook, they'll describe this as the theory of constructivism and that's exactly what it is we're constructing new learning okay um, so in the next slide let's look at an example we're going to introduce new information when we do that we connect to what we already know sure we go from simple to complex makes sense we break it down, we call in the flight instruction profession, we call it breaking it into building blocks. We break it down as far as the learner needs it to be broken down. In some cases, pretty big blocks. In some cases, pretty teeny tiny blocks. Remember, we started with who is this learner? Where exactly are they? I've got a relationship with them, so I know see what they've done, where they're going, how they're progressing, what's in their logbook, what their goals are. So these, these blocks 
um, are going to vary in size depending on the needs of the learner. And we're going to limit um, our bits of information to approximately seven plus or minus two. Now, I, I won't go into detail on that right now. This has to do with uh, research on the capacity of the short-term memory. So the old seven plus or minus two. So in the next slide, let's take a look at the example of navigation logs in cross country. All right, how much are we gonna introduce at one time? All right, true course, great. What's a magnetic course? Well, now I have to learn about mer uh, magnetic uh, variation. Now I've got magnetic heading, wind correction angle. Okay, winds aloft. Oh, latitude and longitude. Wait, this leads all into instructional charts. Now we can talk about pilotage, time speed, distance, ground speed calculation, on and on and on it goes. And very quickly, I'm overloaded. And something like that too, Mike, the first time somebody looks at a flight planning chart, um, you know, the grid that you use for, for planning cross countries. Yes, that's right. exactly it. Uh, and they look at it and they, they, they just, you, you see the deer in headlights look um, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. them do the proper preparation themselves as well as reinforce that. And I will say too, uh, just to add really quick on this, prior to um, some, some recent things, we as instructors had to make that connection and, and um, kind of guide our students along off of syllabi items. Now we have a very good tool um, called the ACS that helps us make a little bit more of those ties to um, why, why am I doing this, okay? Uh, so there are new tools out that we have now um, and, and we're learning more about every day that, that really helps make these connections. Good, exactly right. Helps us identify with them and for them the purpose. Helps us break down this comprehension a little bit more accurately and doesn't tell us in great detail how to do it. Remember, I want you to think of guided chaos. And it's really not chaotic if I'm using tools like that ACS. Absolutely, Rick. So uh, I don't want to introduce too much at once. Let's take a look at the next slide and see, well, how might I do this better? Okay, let's just talk about true heading or, or true course, magnetic course, variation, wind correction, winds aloft. Stop right there. That's enough. Okay, now we're going to take those five items. We're going to practice with them. As we're going to see in just a moment, that is the next phase in the cycle. Then we're going to come back to comprehension and maybe introduce something like now that I understand wind correction angle, true course, and winds aloft, I can get this concept of ground speed. Reconnect with wind correction angle, which I learned previously, start into time speed distance. So um, in the next slide, we see what I want you to do is focus on the content and how it connects. Don't be tempted to overteach before you allow the student to practice with it. Move to practice before overload occurs, okay? So next slide shows us that we're going to try to use as many methods and media as we can to engage as many senses as we can. So senses we've talked about, that's perception. What's methods and media? Remember, methods is what I do. Media is what I use. Uh, and the more of those I can connect and take advantage of, that's multifaceted. If you think about it, the possibilities here are literally limitless. I'm just going to go out to a, um, um, a search engine and, and brainstorm. I'm just going to brainstorm a variety of different methods and a variety of different media I could use. And I'm just going to just go crazy, brainstorm a huge list and say, you know what? I might not use them all. Well, so what? So what? <clears throat> Is this chaotic? No, no, it's not chaotic. It's, it's, think of it as guided chaos. Some of these activities, methods and media I've brainstormed, I'll use. Some I won't. Some I'll use with some learners. Others, I'll use with other learners. 
So looking at the next slide, when I do these activities, when I do these methods, and when we use this media, uh, some of these things will be teacher-centered. If it's teacher-centered, that means I am the focus of the activity. If it's learner-centered, it means they are the focus of the activity. Now, don't adopt a misconception that because it's a learner-centered curriculum, a learner-centered syllabus, a learner-centered endeavor, that every activity I'm going to do will be learner-centered. No, no, you may very well continue to do some teacher-centered activities. What are we doing right now? This is a teacher-centered activity. Uh, not everything will be learner focused, but please don't make everything teacher focused. So consider the brainstorming that can be done with just a just a uh, online search engine. So now we've got ideas on how to help them comprehend new material. Right? And we haven't overloaded them, right, Rick? We're going to stop, build a little bit, go over to practice. Right. That's the next phase in the cycle. So the next slide shows us that part three is practice, and the principle is experience. I have to experience it. I've got to play with it. I've got to do it. So let's think about, on the next slide, the definition that the FAA gives us for learning. We define learning as a change in behavior. So let's say having been exposed to information about left turning tendencies, okay, I've come through the motivation and comprehension phase. I've gained some understanding. I can relate the concept to a climbing airplane, yet I hop in and on the departure leg, I don't put in the right rudder. <laughs> So if I don't put it into practice, I've not learned it yet. In the next phase, we see that, uh, or in the next slide, uh, you know, to practice this, uh, I really don't need you. I really don't need the instructor along. I can do this by trial and error. I mean, after all, who taught Orville and Wilbur Wright about adverse aileron yaw? Nobody. They had to figure that out themselves. Yeah, bless you, Rick. I can do trial and error, but it's going to be much more efficient, not even to mention a lot safer, if my practice is guided by an expert. So in the next slide, we see that we have to incorporate, I have to incorporate that into my behavior. To do that, I have to master it. In order to do that, in other words, master it, I have to practice it. In other words, I have to experience it. So experience comes in two flavors. Experience comes in past and present. Experience in the present is connected to past experience. And this is the construction of knowledge. Once again, we're coming back to the idea of constructivism. With no memory of the, of the past, this is like doing the same thing over and over again. Now, I don't know, uh, some of you out there may have seen this movie called Groundhog Day. Uh, if you have, you know what I'm talking about. But with no memory, it's the same thing over and over again. The next slide shows us that the second flavor of experience is experience from the past. This is what we can recall and apply. Now, this is the importance of an exciting and stimulating experience. When the experience is exciting and stimulating, it makes more neural connections or hooks. The more hooks, the greater chance of it connecting to some other experience and making sense and having meaning. If it makes sense and has meaning, the chances of me remembering it are, are much, much greater. Now, this is where guided practice by an expert comes in. 
this greatly increases the chance of rapid and correct recall in the future. Uh, the, the next slide talks about how practice with an expert guide is so powerful. We get further faster. Now, the CFI must guide practice carefully. Okay, first of all, you have to let them do it. Um, it, it sometimes um, is a mistake by young instructors or instructors early in their career. <laughs> you know, they don't want to give up the control. Uh, the over-controlling instructor, yes. Yeah, the over-controlling <laughs> instructor. Uh, so, you know, a big part of our job is, well, first of all, we have to let you do it. And they may respond with, well, if I let them do it, they're going to make errors. Well, of course they are. Now what? That's right. Well, this is what we call guided practice. Errors that are corrected together in real time is the best example of effective assessment. They're going to remember it correctly and thereafter practice it correctly. Remember, assessment has two major purposes. One is to improve learning. The other is, of course, to determine competence. Now, when I was a boy, I grew up with uh, the Green Bay Packers and Vince Lombardi. You may or may not be familiar with this football coach, but one of the quotes that was attributed to him was, it's not practice that makes perfect, it's perfect practice that makes perfect. Now, obviously, he didn't mean that anybody or anything is perfect. What he's talking about is what we're talking about here. He's talking about guided practice, to have an expert sitting next to you and together, because you have a relationship, we immediately correct the error. We say, now, yeah, you, do you see why that was incorrect? Here's how you fix it. Okay, before we add more back pressure, we shallow the bank. This is how that's done. This is why that went wrong. Here's how we do it right. And it happens immediately at that moment. And from that point forward, then they continue to practice it correctly. That's guided practice. Yeah, and it's really important, too, when you're correcting, to not only correct, but verbalize as you correct. So you have a audio as well as a tactile uh, response in, in the student because, like we said, it's multifaceted. So the more ways you get it into that student, the better they're going to retain. And uh, as a second um, uh, thing on, on that quote that you had, um, the next iteration I've heard was perfect practice makes permanence. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. the reason for that, and, and you know, of course, is we have that practice in our short-term memory, but by doing it as um, perfectly practicing it over and over again, that yields permanence. If we don't do it the same way over and over again, it doesn't yield permanence. Mm -hmm. it, exactly, exactly. So if we look at the next slide, one of the keys here, again, is to properly size that chunk of what is being taught so as not to overload them in comprehension and don't overwhelm them in practice. It's a step-by-step -step thing. Little steps, once again, back to the building blocks. How big are these blocks? Depends on the student. Step-by-step. Uh, -step. So when we look at this four-part learning cycle, think of the bottom, that, that those bottom two quadrants, think of like the pendulum of a, of a grandfather clock. This pendulum swinging from comprehension over to practice, back to comprehension, over to practice. You see an example of that on the next slide. If, for example, uh, we're talking about the skill of landing. Landing is a skill we all teach. An example of this might be to take the effect of airspeed on flight controls and flight at different speeds. In the comprehension phase, right, talk about it, what's involved, we'll teach a little bit, 
Now, we're just going to take those two concepts and we're going to go out to the practice area and we're going to practice those two things. Don't overwhelm, don't overload. Now, let's come back, back to comprehension. What's minimum controllable airspeed? What's a power off stall? What's that all about? How do I correct this? Let's go practice it. Don't overwhelm, don't overload. Come back to comprehension. All right, well, what's a round out? What's a flare? Let's do this at altitude. Ah, I'm starting to put it all together. Now, let's talk about how we're going to round out and flare right down over the concrete. Take that over to practice. So just as an example, swinging back and forth like the pendulum of a clock. Okay, on the next slide, uh, just to review some key points. Remember, you have to let them practice. Correct promptly and guide both their physical safety and their psychological safety. And what do we mean by psychological safety? We'll talk a lot more about that <clears throat> in chapter nine when we talk about risk management. And we'll talk about psychological safety. So this is guided practice. Let them do it. Don't worry that they're going to make mistakes because you're right next to them. Those mistakes aren't going to last. Okay. All right. So this takes us to quadrant four or the fourth part of the learning cycle. Uh, on the next slide, we see that is application. The principle here. Learning's active. It's an active process. In the next slide, we're saying this is where the learner employs all of their skill, all of their knowledge, and all of these attitudes they've developed independent of you. So the cognitive, the psychomotor, the affective, the skill, the knowledge, the attitude, and they're doing it independent of you. Uh, the old classic example is, you know, standing in a field of grass that's about knee high while I'm watching my student on downwind by himself in the airplane for the first time because I just soloed him. <laughs> that is the application phase. They are actively bringing everything together and they are demonstrating their change in behavior. Take a look at the next slide. So your role has changed. And a flight instructor will think to themselves, wow, I've gone from actively coaching to just being a mentor on the side. They are now fully applying and are fully active. Assessment and evaluation of course, could happen in any of the four phases of the cycle, but they, they frequently and commonly occur here. A summative type assessment or evaluation will happen here in the application phase. Uh, what, is, what do we mean by summative? What's the difference between assessment and evaluation? Again, Another topic, we hope you'll come and join us for the professional development, and we're going to talk about that. What's the difference between assessment and evaluation? What is summative? Now, just because you're not in the airplane, don't start to think that you're no longer important to this relationship or this flight student. Uh, your presence as a role model will be very important here. And you're going to be as important or, or even more important than you were uh, when you were with them there in the right seat. Also, at this point, you're setting up for the next skill, and we're just going to come right on around like the face of a clock. And where does application lead us back to? Motivation. Motivation for the next skill, the next skill in sequence, the next more complex skill, um, whatever it may be. And we just keep working our way right on around. We use the example frequently, rectangular pattern to traffic pattern. Um, 
minimum controllable airspeed to round out. Uh, for an instrument student, if you're an instrument instructor, basic attitude instrument flying to multitasking to approaches. So we just keep uh, working our way around um, the cycle here. So in the next slide, we've got some completion activities. So what I do in the book is, and what I want to do here is challenge you to examine how you teach any given flight skill. Using the four-part learning cycle, look at ways to apply the cycle to improve how you teach it. Practice taking any flight skill and breaking it down into small building blocks. Take S-turns across a road, or if you want to take something more advanced, take um, pylon eights, or in the instrument world, you know, try just a, a, a climbing turn or a descending turn. Break that down into its building blocks and try applying the cycle. When you go to the next slide, um, there's two competencies um, I would challenge you to try. One is now reflect on your own teaching and make an honest self-assessment. Am I really breaking it down? Am I really teaching it? Or am I just talking and telling? Competency four, uh, transform a lesson. Take a lesson that I have, maybe one of those lessons I wrote for my CFI binder, and transform it from a teacher-centered to a learner-centered um, lesson uh, and curriculum. So that's what we've got for chapter two. That's the challenge. That's how I hope you can see the, the learning cycle helps us make sense of what is appears to be complex, but is in any case always, always fun and challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that uh, I think everybody should think about is that that would really um, help you catch yourself is if your student asks you a question and you immediately come back with, well, because I said so, or, well, that's the way it's always been done. That phrase right there is a clue that it is definitely not learner-centered and that you need to reevaluate that particular question and uh, see how you could apply that. One of the... Um, there was a lecture in, in my full-time job, I'm in manufacturing, uh, and there was a, a lecturer that um, was trying to teach um, bending techniques for metal. And uh, the way the old timers uh, did it was you had an apprentice and uh, he would get the instructions from the uh, journeyman. And, and when they asked the journeyman, well, well, why do we bend it this way? Why do we do that? And they just said, well, because I said so. And, and that's the way it's always been done. But the student doesn't understand that. They don't have the comprehension or the understanding about, okay, well, there's all of these different components that go into it. How can I recreate this um, in different scenarios? So being much more prepared um, will give the, the student an in-depth learning uh, for those for those tasks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, 100% correct. And don't forget, when we talk about adult learning psychology, uh, because I said so, eh, it doesn't sit well really with most adults, <laughs> especially adults who are paying a lot of money to learn how to fly an airplane. Because I said so works up to about the age of three or four in human development. Yeah, um, and, yeah beyond that, and, and certainly not with adults. Yeah, um, well, a, a really quick story. Uh, you mentioned to, to have the things uh, visually stimulating and uh, engaging and things like that. Um, I had an excellent teacher in, in seventh grade, and I still remember this uh, to this day. In fact, I'm friends with him still. Um, and he had a way of teaching that was both visual, um, auditory, tactile. Uh, we, we changed our, 
our classroom into a cell when we were learning about cells and literally cut out pieces of paper and in different uh, parts of the cell and transformed it. And to this day, I still remember all of the, the components of that, that cell. Um, so it, it just goes to show you uh, if we can do that with instruction, how much more engaging our students will become, uh, how much more um, uh, insightful we're going to get with questions and, and things like that from the student. Mm -hmm. um, Amber asks, what, uh, what are the competencies one and two? Mike, uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Um, <laughs> I was going to mention that uh, this is chapter two of the book, which is why it's competencies three and four. Competencies one and two are from chapter one, uh, and chapter one is about human behavior and uh, just so that you have them online. Competency number one actually is write your own teaching philosophy. Competency number two is recognize what motivates and demotivates your flight student and use that knowledge to build a teaching learning relationship. So those came from chapter one. That's why these said competencies three and four. And, and, Amber, and Rick, yep, and Amber, sorry, let me a live stream in January that Mike did on chapter one of his book. Uh, if you go to nafinet.org, click on Mentor Live, you can go ahead and view that, uh, as well as, I believe, get Wings credit for that uh, also. Yeah, Wings credit for the first one as well, absolutely. Uh, and touch just quickly on those learning styles, Rick, and I, I love your story about that seventh grade teacher. That really supports what we know from research about learning. There is a... Um, misconception about learning styles. And you were talking about visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. And let's just stay with that just for a second. Uh, is there such a thing as a learning style? In other words, might you be more visual and I might be more kinesthetic and person three might be more auditory? Yes. Research indicates that in fact, adults do commonly have a preferred style. Now, the important question is, if I teach to your style, will you learn more? The misconception is yes, that is wrong. The actual answer is no. Research shows us that regardless of your style, Rick, if your seventh grade teacher uses visual and auditory and kinesthetic, you will learn more no matter your style. So that was a, that was a beautiful example, and, and research bears it out. Um, Jonathan from Facebook asked uh, really quick, how CFI evaluations help develop educators? Ah, yeah, that is a beautiful question. And it that is. gets into the difference between assessment and evaluation. And just to, in, in one sentence, evaluation is more about judgment and, and, and thinking skills and ability where assessment is more about um, specific skill sets and, and competence versus, versus lack of competence. So if I use an evaluation approach, uh, I'm able to look at not just a teacher's skill in applying a method, but their attitude. Remember we talked early on about attitude their attitude towards their learner, their attitudes towards themselves, how they feel about teaching. Are they engaging in a relationship? Um, so evaluation helps us shed light on that when we look at how effective uh, any particular instructor or teacher might be. I, did that answer the question? I'm I, not I sure. Think so. I think so. Um, and one thing we should really t uh, touch on um, really quick, we got four minutes left, uh, is the environment, okay? The environment that the student is learning in. Um, we all know that the airplane is the worst classroom. And uh, part of that is because there's so much going on. But part of that also is because that uh, a certain portion of, of their brain may be distracted uh, from nervousness or 
um, unknown or, or things like that. Um, is that something that, that by preparing more on the ground, we can help that classroom environment in the airplane become more effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Yeah, a little bit of pre-planning. Um, and when we look at curriculum, we, we refer to a, a skill or a competency and we talk about its criteria that we use to assess it. And then we talk about the conditions under which it will be performed. So this environment question is very much about conditions. Now, I know when I actually go to shoot a live ILS in an airplane, I'm gonna be, of course, in the airplane, whether I wanna be or not. And, I mean, that's where I do this skill. Um, and am probably going to be IMC in the real world. And so those are the best conditions in which to assess it. Those are certainly not the best conditions in which to teach it. I can, I can make a lot of headway by teaching uh, the skills related to that in a different, quieter, safer, calmer environment or set of conditions and then transferring that at a later date to reality. Yeah, I can, I can, I can really help the student a lot, not to mention save them probably a, a few bucks, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please type them in. Um, one, one more thing I wanted to add is um, know your students. And what I mean by that is, is really get to know them, know what their occupation is, um, you know, I, I've gotten more friends in this business now uh, just by knowing their, their, my students. And by doing that, it gets them more comfortable with you. Now, you don't want to get to the point of being, um, you know, distracted in the, com in the cockpit, of course, with unnecessary conversation. But if you have that connection, then um, I found that, that, that it's, they're much more receptive uh, to the educational um, material that you're trying to convey to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Rick, so kind of going down those same lines, tell me, uh, just harken back, just was a couple of sentences ago, but I'm trying to remember exactly what you just said. Uh, as far as the emotional connection? Yeah. Uh, having a, a connection with your student? Um, what oh, I mean, okay. I'm sorry. That. yeah, that was it. I, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt you. I, I had a thought on that and, and you're absolutely right. When we talk about building a relationship, uh, here, here's, <laughs> here's the thought that I lost. You know, sometimes we use this word relationship and it, uh, I don't know, it, maybe it makes some people uncomfortable because we're thinking of one particular type of relationship or we're thinking of a romantic relationship. Now in chapter one of my book, I talk about that. No, 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 no. There's a lot of different types of relationships. We are talking about a professional teacher-learner relationship. Now, any relationship, in order to, to, to start it and to build it and to build upon it, we need to do, Rick, what you just suggested. I often, and I'm sure many, probably all flight instructors do, say, well, what are your goals? And at the flight school where I teach, we just automatically assume they're all going to be airline pilots, right? No, well, but that's not true, you know. So you, you might be surprised if you, just questions like, what are your goals? What's your currency? What's the last time you've flown? What did you like about flying? What kind of flying do you like? What are your hobbies? Without getting too personal, um, we're building a relationship. <laughs>